So if we all agree that algebra is about having a set and having an operation on that set, particularly a binary operation, so that at least we have a magma to work with. Let's return to those other ideas that you were mentioning in our initial discussion, which is things like algebra should give us a way to simplify expressions. Algebra should give us a way to solve equations. Well, if we have an operation table for a magma, we should have enough to be able to do those things, right? So let's take a peek um, at the following operation table. Um, and I just want to talk through, I'm going to have you start this activity and just do a, a piece of it. Then we'll come back together, talk a little bit more, and we'll do the second phase of it. Um, but the, the first piece of this activity is as follows. Here's an operation table for a magma, right? The elements in my set are called A, B, and C, right? And here's the results of, of operating on those elements. Um, and what I want you to do, first of all, in your teams, just using this operation table, are these first three exercises. What is the value of C operate A? What is or are the solutions of the equation A operate X equals A? So you might have to think a little bit backwards here, where we're solving this equation for X, right? Same thing with number three. What is or are the solutions of the equation X operate C equals B? So just using this operation table to answer those first three three problems uh, in your groups. And then once we've done that, we'll shift gears and talk about the next phase of it, which is to investigate some of the properties that a magma might have. All right, so there was no fooling you uh, in doing these first three. Oh, I'm muted. There's no fooling you in doing these first three questions, um, just navigating your way around the operation table. The only first thing that we had to remember was which order this table is communicating the operation in. So we agreed uh, earlier on that if I'm looking for the result of C operate A, I'm going to look on the row that C exists and on the column that A exists. So the bottom left corner of the table. So C operate A is equal to B, according to this operation table. Um, similarly, if I want to find out A operate what is equal to A, I'm going to find A on the row and then say, where do I find the A's in the table on that same row? I find them here. And so the two solutions of the equation AX equals A are X equals A and X equals B. Right. They're the two solutions of that equation. But the equation x operates c equals b indicates I should look in the column that has c and find out how to get b in that column. But there is no place in that column that has a b. So there are no x's for which x operates c is equal to b, so this is an example of an equation that has no solution. So one of the things that we're already observing is that if I have a magma and it doesn't necessarily have a lot of friendly properties, I can have things like equations that have more than one solution. I can do things like have equations that have no solutions, right? Um, but you suspect that if we add enough algebraic properties on top of our magma, if, the, if that operation satisfies some nice properties, maybe we can whittle that down. Maybe we can live in a place where all of my equations are consistent. They all have a solution. And when they have a solution, they have a unique solution. So we don't get multiple solutions. And that's the situation we find ourselves in when we study group theory, for example. Um, in a group, um, every equation can be solved. Every equation like this can be solved for a unique, uh, to have a unique solution. And in the operation table for a group, every element appears once and only once on its row and on its column, for example. But not every magma is a group. And not, not every magma has to be a group. But which properties that we add into the mix sort of make our magmas have more interesting structure uh, on top of them. So magmas are like the Wild West in general, right? If we don't have any specific properties that we associate with the operation on our set, then we can't really do a whole lot sort of the in a theoretical basis. We can draw an operation table and we can do that kind of stuff all day, but if we want to understand them at a deeper level, we probably want some additional algebraic properties. And when I say algebraic property, um, what I mean is an equation involving one or more elements of S and on which at least one of the variables in that equation is universally quantified. And all that is just a mouthful to say that it's some algebraic sentence that we want to be true for all values of at least one of its variables, right? And these are some examples of algebraic properties but some examples of properties that we've probably heard of before uh, are the commutative property. The commutative property says that for all elements x and y, the result of x operate y has to be the same as the result of y operate x, right? This is the kind of fun property that addition of integers, for example, uh, happens to satisfy, right? x plus y is the same thing as y plus x. And so if I look in an operation table for a commutative operation, I'm going to see the same result in the xy column as I see in the yx column. Right? So my table should have this nice symmetry uh, as long as I sort of list all the elements in the row and column in the same order. I should get this nice symmetry across the diagonal in my operation table if my operation is commutative, if it satisfies the commutative property. 
Um, some of the properties on this list are a little bit weirder. Um, the flexible property, right? That says that if I operate X times Y times, X operate Y, and then the result is operated by X, that I get the same thing as if I move those parentheses over, right? X operate on Y and then X. This is a special case of the more general property called the associative property that says for all three elements, X, Y, and Z, that if I operate on all three of them consecutively, it doesn't matter if I do the first pair and then the third, or if I do the first and then the pair with the second and third, I get the same answer, right? The associative, the associative property is the one that gets all the press, right? Because addition and multiplication, for example, of real numbers uh, satisfies the associative property. We also have these funny distributive properties. Often in algebra, we think of distributive properties in a context where we have more than one operation, like multiplication and addition. And multiplication distributes over addition, right? That's the usual way that we see it in high school algebra. But a single operation on a magma, right, can, for example, distribute over itself. X operate on the quantity Y operate Z. We can distribute the X across. So I get X operate Y operated on X operate Z. We would call that a left distributive property. Um, a right distributive property is the same thing, just on the other side of the parentheses, because the order might matter if we have a magma that doesn't have the commutative property, for example. Um, there are some other really wacky ones here. The idempotent property that says that for every element in my magma, if I operate on it with itself, the result is again itself. So x operate x is always equal to x for all x's in my magma. So that's kind of a funny one. Um, we also have these cancellation properties. So if I have an equation x operate y equals x operate z, and I have the left cancellation property, it means I can get rid of the x's and conclude that y is equal to z. Right. That, again, seems like a straightforward thing just because we're so accustomed to working in magmas that have this property, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division of real numbers. It has Those have these properties, right? We can just cancel on that side of the equation on the left side and we're done. Same thing with the right cancellation property. Um, the bottom two properties on this list are ones that I want to give a little bit more lip service to also. Um, there's the identity property. And, this, and the reason these are a little bit more interesting is that they are more elaborately quantified. The identity property for a magma says that there exists an element, we're going to call it E, such that for all X's in my set, E operated on X and X operated on E both give me X as the result. So in other words, E is some element that I can't tell if it's operated on something or not because it kind of invisibly just sort of melts into the thing that it operates upon. So the prototypical example for this might be zero in a magma where the operation is addition, right? If I add zero to a number, I can't tell if I've added that zero at all, right? It's the additive identity element, right? Um, for the multiplication case, one would be my multiplicative identity. I can't tell if I've multiplied something by one or not. One is the identity element in, um, for example, the magma of integers under multiplication. Right? And then there's the invertibility property, which sort of the way that I've written it here relies upon the identity property existing in the first place. You can actually disentangle them in some funny ways, but we're not going to do that uh, in our course. The invertibility property says that every element in my magma has an inverse element, and it becomes an inverse because when I operate on those two elements together, the result is the identity element. Right? So for every x, there exists a y such that x operate y and y operate x both give me the identity element e. So I already have to have the identity property satisfied and the invertibility property holds if every element has an alter ego such that when I operate those two together, I get the identity, whether I do them in one order or the other. So again, the prototype here are in the magma of integers under addition, every uh, integer, its opposite integer, right, will be its inverse in that structure because when I add them together, five plus negative five is going to give me zero, which is the identity element in that magma. Um, in the case of a magma with multiplication, let's say the rational numbers with multiplication, right? The inverse of eight is going to be one eighth, right? Because when I multiply those two together, the result is one, which is the identity element in the multiplicative magma, right? So identity and invertibility are super useful things to have because they give me kind of a way of saying there's an element that does nothing, right? There's an element that's kind of invisible. That's the identity element. And that for everything that an element does, that can also be undone. That's the sort of invertibility property. If I add five, then I also have something that I can add to undo that addition of five. I can add negative five, right? So everything has kind of a mirror image and alter ego. And so the more of these properties that a magma has, generally the better that we can understand it and the more interesting and useful examples that we can come up with, right? So 
there here's a laundry list of vocabulary we're not going to use all of these ideas equally but um, i wanted to get some, some definitions down on the table right um, because the more structure that we add the more interesting we tend to find mangoes we also give those kinds of mangoes different names at one end of the spectrum the most properties that we can have in this list that we're looking at are enjoyed by what are called the abelian groups these are magmas that have an associative operation uh, that has an identity and which has the invertibility property so everything that can be done can also be undone and for which also the commutative property holds so all four of those hold and we get the best of all worlds the abelian groups um, we end up studying abelian groups a lot in an introductory course in abstract algebra but we can also study groups by taking the commutativity potentially away but keeping associativity identity and invertibility right if we have those three things then we're doing group theory um, and a lot of the really interesting groups including the one that we're going to really specialize on in our next class the permutation groups um, those are not commutative but they do still have an associative identity and invertible uh, operation and it's as we start to pull those threads away that we get the less well-studied algebraic structures, the ones you probably don't meet in a typical undergraduate uh, uh, math major. So if we take away invertibility, but we keep associativity and identity, we get something called a monoid. Right? So this would be a place where I have an element that does nothing, that's invisible, um, but I don't necessarily know that I can undo everything that I might otherwise do. One example of a monoid might be um, all of the non-negative integers with addition. That's a, a magma, right? If I add two non-negative integers, I'm going to get a non-negative integer. It has an associative operation because addition is associative on the integers. It has an identity, namely zero, but it doesn't have inverses, right? I have a five in that set, but I don't have anything which I can add to five that gives me zero right? because I only have the non-negative integers. So that would be an example of a monoid. If I, instead of pulling out identity, I, I pull out invertibility, um, I get something called a uh, a semi-group, right? It's a associative, but it doesn't have an identity element and it's not invertible, right? So maybe the set of all non-zero, no, wait, set of all non-zero integers doesn't work. Um, how about the set of all positive integers, the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, and so forth. We don't have an identity element anymore, um, but the addition on the natural numbers is still an associative operation. So we have a semi-group, right? The, the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, et cetera, with addition would form a semi-group. If we take associativity away, now we're being really crazy, right? So we're looking at operations which, for which it matters where we place the parentheses if we're doing the operation three times in a row. One example of an operation that's like that is subtraction, right? X minus Y minus Z, it matters which minus that I do first in terms of what answer that I get, right? So the integers equipped with subtraction uh, would be an example of a structure which is not associative, but it does have an identity element, zero, and it does have inverses, let's think. If the identity is zero, because subtracting zero is the same thing as not doing anything, right? Um, actually, that would be a right identity, but not a left identity. So this gets kind of even more intricate. Um, but inverses are kind of interesting because every element would be its own inverse, right? Five is the inverse of five, because when I take five minus five, I get zero, the identity element, at least the right identity element. Um, so that would be something called a loop or a MUFON loop. Um, and if we have not, a, uh, not an associative property, but we do still have identity and invertibility. And if we take one of those or the other away, we can get an even more basic structure called either a unital magma, which is what happens when we know we have an identity operation, but not necessarily anything else, um, or a quasi group where we give up the identity, but we still have invertibility somehow, even though we haven't really talked about what that would mean. So where I want to wrap things up for today um, is to go back to this operation table that we were looking at just a minute ago um, and see if you can explain and you want to write a couple sentences for each one of these if you can why the operation on this this magma operation in this operation table is a unital magma and so if we look back here unital means it has the identity property the identity property means there exists an element e such that e operate x and x operate e are equal to x for all elements x Right, so we're sort of going back up the terminology ladder here to figure out how we would justify this. So explain why we have a unital magma in this table, why we do not have a monoid. So what is it that fails uh, to, the, what is it that's failing in this table that shows us we're not working with a monoid? Um, and then decide with your group whether or not we have a MUFON loop. Okay. So just to get us uh, some comfort using those terms, but then also using the operation table and the associated algebraic properties to either verify or disverify that this structure is a unital magma, a monoid, or a MUFON loop.
So we can use this operation table to assess whether or not this magma is a unital magma, whether it's or not it's a monoid, and whether or not it's a MUFONG loop. And just by sort of taking those terms back apart to figure out which properties we're trying to talk about. So a unital magma is one that has the identity property. And the identity property says we need to show that there exists an element, let's call it E, but it's called the identity element, which is an invisible operation. If I operate on it on either the left or the right, I can't tell that I've done anything at all because it just gives me the same element back again. Um, and so you found that this magma that's being described in this operation table is in fact a unital magma because it has an identity element. And what is the identity element in this magma? B. It's B. B times anything is going to give me that same thing. B times A gives me A. B times B is B. B times C gives me C. And the same is also true when I multiply by B on the right. A times B is A. B times B is B, C times B is C. So whether I multiply, quote unquote, by B either on the left or on the right, I can't tell that I've done anything at all. So B is our identity element in this magma, and so we have uh, a unital magma. Notice that there's only one identity element in this unital magma, but there could be, in other unital magmas, more than one identity element. It turns out that in a group, there cannot be, um, but in weaker structures, there can be. But the structure is not a monoid, and going back, monoid means that we have to have identity element, which we know we have now, and we also have to have associativity. So if we're going to show that this thing is not a monoid, we should try to show that the operation is not an associative operation. And the way to do that is just to find three elements such that if I move the parentheses in that product, I get different answers. So this team, for example, found that C times C, then multiplied by A, operated on by A, gives me a different answer than if I did C times the product of C with A. Right. One of them gives me B, the other one gives me C. So I have a disagreement here, which gives the lie to the associative property. So since this is not an associative operation, we know that we don't, in fact, have a monoid. Now, what about a MUFONG loop? A uh, MUFONG loop is one that has the identity property, which we already know, but which also has the invertibility property. And so let's look back at the invertibility property. It says that every element in my set needs to have an alter ego, an inverse element Y, that has the property that when I operate in either order on x with its alter ego y, x operate y, y operate x, both of those products have to return the identity element to me. So I need to be able to get to the identity by starting from any of the elements in my set, either by multiplying on the left or by multiplying on the right. When I look in my operation table, my identity element, I remind myself, is b. So the question is, can I always get to b by starting from any of my elements? Well, if I start from c, I can get to b. Right, so C times A is going to give me B. So A is the right inverse of C. Um, B is its own inverse, evidently. You should be able to show that, in fact, every identity element in a group is, in fact, its own inverse. Um, you can do this follows from the identity property. But A, on the other hand, has got a problem. Right? Well, A actually has a left inverse because C times A gets me to the identity element. It does not have a right inverse because A times anything never gets me to the identity element. I don't have a B in that row. Right? So since my identity doesn't appear in that first row, A does not have a double-sided inverse. Even if it does have a left inverse, its left inverse is C, because C times A gives me B, it does not have a right inverse. And the way that we've stated the identity property requires both of those left and right inverses to not only exist, they also need to agree with one another. So this is actually a very strong version of the invertibility property. It's the kind that we take for granted in a group theory course, for example. Um, so that's examples of how to use the operation table and the various properties that define these different algebraic structures to assess what's going on where.